Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to the show. You're watching Let's Talk with me, Anwar Mir. Today we are talking about assisted dying. That's the bill that's going through Parliament as we speak. It effectively will mean that uh, anybody who wants to be assisted in dying, uh, well, let's put it bluntly, uh, in committing suicide, then they will be able to do so in the event that the law is passed. Uh, this is an interactive show and with me there are uh, two guests in the studio and, and I'm going to be shortly joined by two guests uh, by way of uh, video link. Allow me to introduce my two guests uh, uh, for now. Uh, to my right, Mr. Abu Mumin. Uh, you uh, all know him as the founder of the 13 Rivers Trust and indeed the founder of Eden Care uh, and an active member of the community. Abu Baisankum, Abu Mumin Baisankum. Welcome, Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank thank you. you for joining us. And to my left, ladies and gentlemen, is the MD of the Tafida uh, Raki Foundation. He's Mr. Jackie. Uh, Chaudhry by profession of financial uh, consultant, but I'm pleased to say that he's joining us today uh, wearing his hat uh, uh, in regard to the uh, Tefid Iraqi Foundation. Uh, Jackie Ray, Sankum, welcome Thank to the show. Islam. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. As I was saying, this is an interactive show. Shortly, there will be a number at the bottom of your screens, should you wish to participate uh, by airing your views or indeed posing a question to any of our panelists, feel free to do so. And we would like to hear what you have to say. Do you support the assisted dying bill, or do you strongly feel uh, against it? What is the uh, impact uh, of this, do you think, vis-a-vis uh, -vis perhaps your faith, your uh, personal beliefs, or indeed uh, what you think in terms of the state of the uh, healthcare system in the United Kingdom? Do have your say. We'd love to hear uh, what you indeed have to say, and uh, we shall take it from there. For now, uh, allow me to hear the views of, of our guests. And uh, for the moment, I'm going to start by talking to Mumin Bai. Um, uh, about his take uh, on on this. Anyway, now, uh, you do a lot of work in this sort of field, this sort of area. Uh, you're very active in the community, uh, particularly, and you provide a great service in all the things that you do, and, and our community know you very well for that. What's your take on this particular bill that is going through uh, at the moment? Okay, Jazakallah Khair for inviting me. Um, uh, eating care, the work that we do is with people who are terminally ill, chronically ill, and socially isolated. And we have dealt with a lot of people. Um, recently, one of the things we do is produce research. And recently, we launched our research on euthanasia and Islamic perspective. And we interviewed renowned scholars like Shah Akram Nadwi and Sister Nadia from Bima. Now, on a personal note, now let me say, my, 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 my mother, she was terminally ill. Oh. And the doctors gave her six months to live. So she falls under the category if somebody, according to the doctor, uh, will live below six months. Okay? So they were at that time offering her palliative care. So if somebody falls ill, this is what they do. Yeah. Now they're talking about assistant dying or you know uh, killing people who are elderly or who are sick now we insisted on further treatment and the were members of the fa of our family said no let's go down the palliative care route alhamdulillah mum went in, uh, into with with the long term treatment mum went into living another 15 years oh, into her life, life. alhamdulillah yeah. she passed away in 2013 i'm just giving you an example yeah. Now, life is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God. It should not be taken by human beings. Now, they would tell you, Lord Falkner, he presented the argument for pro. Two doctors saying uh, uh, a patient will live uh, within six months and die, and then a judge. Now, as a child protection social worker that I did for many years, mm. we, with intense in investigation, child abuse continues to happen. Right. Now, so that means practitioners, the courts, the doctors, everybody make mistakes. Yeah. Now, what my worry is, we've seen during COVID-19, disproportionate number of Bangladeshi Muslim um, uh, people have passed away. We did a lot of burial. One of the services we provide is burial. And what we're going to find, disproportionate number 
or BME communities are going to be affected by this. And we're going to see people, uh, doctors will say they have six months to live and they may have mental health problems. Families will not be, even be around. They will ask that person who's unwell and that person may feel burdened or they're burdening their family and might consent. This is a serious issue. And I think we, um, we need to be aware as a community and we need to say no. We need to write to our MPs and we need to say, say no, okay? It's wrong on a human level, it's wrong on an Islamic level. That's my point. Great, thank you very much indeed. I, I do have my guests um, who have joined uh, via Zoom and uh, I do want to come back to a couple of points that you make because you make some very important points. So allow me to introduce our two guests. First of all, I've got Dr. Sharon Raymond, who's a general practitioner. Uh, Dr. Raymond, thank you for joining us. And um, I hopefully I've also got Shalina Begum, uh, who is a solicitor and the mother of Tafida uh, Rakib. Uh, Shalina Begum, uh, can you hear us? Yeah, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, firstly, if I go to uh, Dr. Raymond. Dr. Raymond, um, this bill that's going through Parliament uh, at the moment, uh, what's your take, please, on the assisted dying uh, bill? Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me uh, this evening. Thank you for having both of us. Um, I mean, I, uh, I share the concerns of quite a large number of, uh, of people in the UK around the assisted dying bill. Uh, I can understand why it's been uh, why it's been proposed. Uh, I can understand people's concerns and worries. You know, when they see uh, loved ones uh, and others, you know, going through uh, a lot of suffering. However, I think uh, your your guest just now has raised quite a few important points uh, around some of the the issues that may arise. Um, and there are issues around uh, determining how long a person has to live. Uh, there are issues around uh, people who are more vulnerable, uh, assessing their capacity to make decisions, um, exploring, uh, you know, what the reasons might be for them to reach such a decision. And that may relate to the fact that they are isolated. They may not have adequate uh, family uh, or other support. And indeed, the right level of palliative care may not be in place. And we know that there are issues around palliative care uh, that... Uh, that we struggle with in this country. Um, and I do think that that's an area that needs to be explored and addressed very thoroughly before we start, uh, you know, going into a, an, an assisted dying uh, law. Uh, so those are just some of those issues. And obviously, you know, we don't want people to feel that they are a burden. Uh, we don't want them to be making this decision from a position uh, of fear or loneliness, or perhaps there may be you know, mental health or other issues, uh, uh, you know, in, involved here. Uh, and the other concern is that it could well be a slippery slope. Uh, it could lead to, um, you know, to people, say, for example, we've seen abroad that people, uh, you know, have been, uh, have uh, effectively committed uh, suicide, have been, uh, you know, uh, have uh, ended their lives or have had assistance to end their lives. Uh, when they have, for example, mental health conditions, so uh, some of which may potentially be treatable, obviously difficult to say, and it's a case-by-case -case basis, but, uh, but these things all, all need to be considered in the round before we move to considering an assisted dying bill, which does carry many risks. And I know, speaking to colleagues of mine, uh, who may or may not uh, be people of faith, so this cuts across people of faith, no faith at all, uh, you know, many of them do have deep-seated concerns uh, about how this law, if it does come in, could be affected and some of the risks. Because, of course, if we make mistakes and we know that mistakes can happen, there is no turning back. Um, so just a few points uh, from me. I'm sure Shalina can, uh, can pick up sure. uh, and expand on that. Sure. But just before she does, Dr. Raymond, I think you summarised very well the salient aspects of this particular bill. But um, And I think you also hit the nail on the head when you talk about the fact that somebody may subjectively feel that they're either a burden or that they've got nothing to look forward to. And they may feel that, uh, I suspect, pressure, so to speak, that they need to um, accelerate their, 
the death. Uh, what measures do you think can be put in place to make sure that uh, those sorts of things don't override the actual decision, that it is a, a well thought out uh, uh, decision? <laughs> I think that's where the challenge lies um, and that's where the difficulties lie, uh, uh, you know, in a bill uh, or law of this sort. Um, it is, you know, maybe very difficult to unpick, you know, what is uh, prompting people to make uh, these decisions. You know, is it possible that if they'd had perhaps better palliative care, uh, more people supporting them, uh, a secure home even perhaps, uh, you know, all these things go into the mix and, it, and it's difficult to know what might be motivating that individual uh, to make this decision. Uh, of course, we haven't even spoken about the potential for unscrupulous, you know, relatives uh, uh, and, uh, and contacts and carers and so on, um, who, you know, in the worst cases uh, may, may see some uh, kind of secondary gain. Um, in precipitating someone's demise. But, well, uh, you know, mm. these are all things that need to be considered and are fraught with risk. So yeah, yeah. Uh, how to mitigate that risk, I think, will be extremely challenging. Um, right. And for that reason, uh, I think it's not something that uh, is wise to proceed with. Um, and I think what we do need to do, though, is look uh, at how palliative care services are being delivered, where there are gaps in services, and how we can ensure that people get the best and most compassionate care, um, you know, at the end of life, uh, in order to support, in order to support them. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, one of the things you talk about is perhaps the uh, the, the motive of, as you described, them, unscrupulous relatives who may have their own agenda uh, and so forth. Um, you I, have... I would hope there are not many of those, but you know, I mean, yeah, but but there are there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sadly, they exist. There are po it's a possibility. It's a possibility, but, but yeah, so you have that piece of the jigsaw, but then additionally, you have other issues as well, such as, for example, somebody who is advised by a medical profession that they have a number of months to live and that's it. And then the, 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 the person who has received that advice, they are then calculating or balancing, so to speak, the fact that they may subjectively feel that they're a burden on their families, uh, whether or not they can return to their home and whether there's adequate care there. Many families, for example, um, are not able to provide the additional care. So that elderly person might feel that they will be a burden in, in imposing yeah. uh, uh, that yeah. need upon a third party. Uh, but then, if, Absolutely. But then yeah. as we've heard Absolutely. from uh, um, Mr. Mumin, who says that uh, his own experience is that um, sometimes the advice may not be accurate and it certainly should not factor as a... Uh, or feature as a uh, uh, as, uh, as a principle of whether or not um, that person should accelerate their death. Some people have described it as assisted suicide. W would you say that's a fair uh, description? Uh, I think before we get into the semantics, I just want to point out, and I'm sure you and uh, all your viewers are aware, that not everyone has a home. Uh, not everyone has loved ones. And I think, you know, particularly thinking about those who are most vulnerable, most isolated, whatever age they may be, uh, those pressures, those, those the, you know, the insecurity within their own life. I mean, you know, if perhaps they may be homeless uh, or, you know, really, really struggling alone, uh, then, of course, you know, making these decisions, uh, there will be, you know, those considerations may well come into it. Uh, would I call it assisted suicide or assisted dying? I mean, I suppose the term uh, the terminology matters because if you call it assisted suicide, it just sounds a lot more dramatic um, uh, and uh, not quite right. Assisted dying, I suppose, gives the impression that uh, what you're aiming towards, and I'm sure this is what those who are proposing this bill feel, is that it's to allow people to die uh, with dignity, not to prolong their suffering, uh, and so on. So I, I can understand why that terminology uh, is used. Um, and it would be, you know, would be with the involvement, so that death would be with the involvement of medical practitioners. So strictly speaking, uh, would you call it suicide? Would you call it assisted suicide? I think, you know, the bottom line is, you know, is this bill right or wrong? Is this bill fraught with risk? Um, and these are the issues on the table. And I think if people do feel strongly, if people are concerned, it's important that they make their voice heard. 
Um, that's what I would say. Th thank you for your valuable contribution. Uh, for, for now, let me move on, on to uh, Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum, uh, now you've gone through, uh, unfortunately, you've gone through a situation where you've had to make uh, decisions. And sometimes uh, you, you have felt that uh, the kind of decisions that you're expected to make or pressured to make may not be the ones that you really wanted to uh, as a family make. Uh, would you share with our viewers perhaps uh, that consideration? I appreciate it's a yes. difficult. I appreciate yes. it's difficult to recollect, difficult to uh, talk about, but uh, you know, in, in the best way you can. Yes, I will. So, for instance, the bill does say that should it's not mentioning children at this moment, but maybe later on they will add children as well. So with Tafida. A team of almost 15 senior consultants actually got the prognosis wrong. They actually said in June 2019 that within two weeks, Tafida will die. We've actually passed already six years and every day she's doing well. So my understanding is that I don't think the medical professionals will always get it right. So there will be some premature deaths because the medical professionals will, will get it wrong. They'll say, okay, the life expectancy is only six months, which the law states, which the bill is currently saying there has to be six months. So this is where my concern is that what do we then do if that happens? And it has already happened with Tafida. And I'm sure there are many other children, many other adults across the country, it is happening. So this is where my major concern is, is that the medical professionals will get it wrong. Then what happens? All, all right. Um, so obviously we, we, we're not suggesting that the medical profession is getting it wrong because of anything sinister. I suspect it's probably an assessment on the basis of the evidence uh, before them at that particular time. Uh, and of course, we're, we're very pleased, we're delighted that Tafid is doing so well. Uh, but in terms of the situation that as you see it, because of the fact that you have had those tough decisions to make, put, yourselves, put yourself in this situation where, for example, if Tafida was an adult and uh, you had this bill which had passed and you were being pressured into uh, making tough decisions as to whether or not it really should continue, the care should continue, or whether you know, Tafida was suffering and you wanted to accelerate that particular death. Uh, what's the decision or what kind of considerations would you um, undertake when okay. making that decision? Sure. Sure. So myself, myself, I will definitely say no, but I believe that there will be many parents in my position who will actually cons might consider this bill and say, okay, no, my child is suffering, you know, let me put an end. So they will be put under a lot of pressure. And I was also put under pressure as well. I had doctors telling me that keeping her alive will actually end my career, will put an end to my marriage, will ruin my relationship with family members. So there was already pressure. There was, I mean, what I'm going to say is that this particular bill, there have already been, and I will say openly on air, that this has already been happening behind the back door. Now they're trying to do it, the front door, that's so that they make it into a bill, into a law. So I will say this, that yes, if this was presented to me, I will definitely say no. I'm never going to accept this and I will continue fighting for my daughter's life. But there will be many other parents in our community who will, first of all, believe what the doctors are saying. So they'll think that, OK, it's ending the suffering. Some might even ignore the religion aspects as well and actually agree. And it has happened. I have seen it in the hospital, I have seen it. Many parents were influenced into consenting to withdrawal of care because various hospitals have chaplains who are following different sects of Islam, which says apparently you can give permission. So parents are already doing it. Parents are already giving consent. So I think that you know there will be, there will be sadly speaking, there will be many parents in our communities and also nationally who will be pressurized into giving consent. They're thinking that let's get rid of this disabled child. I'll be free from that child. So I think that, yes, parents will be under a lot of pressure to consider ending right. a child's life. 
All right. Well, we, we've got the MD of the Tafid Iraqi Foundation here, Jack Irabai, and I'm going to ask him a, a couple of questions. Now, uh, Dr. Raymond uh, makes some very, very powerful points, doesn't she? I mean, she provides a balanced uh, view as to exactly uh, what, what the score is. Um, now, uh, she describes as semantics, however, the point about whether it's suicide or whether it's actually um, assisted dying. Um, as I understand it, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, if somebody is wishing to take their own life and wanting help to do that, um, is that not suicide? Because from a strictly literal point of view, um, you know, if you want to die, that's an act of suicide. Um, in terms of dying, assisted dying, when somebody is dying, we all assist. We assist them when they're dying, hopefully not to die, or at least have some comfort when they're dying, but we don't accelerate their death, uh, which is what this euphemism, in my personal view, my humble opinion, it's a euphemism and nothing more. Uh, by saying assisted dying, what we're actually saying is we're sort of like uh, making it very soft. Uh, we're saying that you're dying, but we're assisting you to die rather than assisting in, 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 in that particular moment. I don't know if, if that really um, uh, resonates with you, but in any event, uh, you've heard what Ms. Begum says as well. Uh, what's your take on this particular bill, um, particularly with the hat that you wear? I mean, I'll go a little bit, uh, let me more extend this. Sure. It's not about uh, die or or um, suicide, I would say it's more like a murder. Oh dear. Yeah, so it's, uh, it depends. I mean, it's all case by case. Mm. So who is going to define this case by case? Yeah, there is a specialist there, there is a, I mean, uh, doctors there, but beyond that, there's so many things already been happened and there is a case, many, many case studies is there. Mm. So if you, if you go into that, we'll see, just to give an example by Mbwin Bai's mother, just to give another example by Tafida, Mm. Rakib. Mm. So we know there's so many cases been happen similarly. So I would say um, proponent, uh, positive party they're saying is, uh, is uh, dying with dignities, yeah. but dead is a dead right. and suicide, obviously suicide and suicide is not right. It's uh, completely wrong. Right. Okay. So, uh, and, and, and very briefly, um, if I could ask you, uh, in a nutshell, because we're about to go into a break, um, this bill, which is going through Parliament, if it's if it goes through and if it yeah. becomes law, uh, what what do you think the impact will be in terms of your community? So sure, that's the most alarming thing is that's why we are here mm -hmm. today. Person myself is uh, this the bill is happening in, in the next few days time, mm. and our community, I would say most of us. We haven't got any clue about it. Right. So this is very alarming for us. And if we don't act now, that we're going to regret. And we're going to regret it's a very big time. So this is the right time for us to act. And act mean act now. Right. And uh, how are we going to do that? I mean, to talk on listening, that's not good enough. No. We can't stop this. I mean, all of us, the all viewers, our, our humble request to all viewers tonight, please contact with your MPs? L lobby your members of yes, parliament. Yes, absolutely. Uh, as Mumin Bai was saying, and, and luckily uh, people like Mumin Bai were strong enough to uh, um, you know, hold out and actually um, stand up to the kind of pressure that his loved one was facing. And uh, yes, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we must go to a short break. When we come back, we're going to continue with this discussion. Do stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back very shortly, inshallah. Hope to see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you.